TCS Metro Sports presents Big East Basketball. The Big East Conference will always be remembered for the moments it has given us in basketball. We think of the Big East Tournament at Madison Square Garden, many of its different national champions that it's produced, and even the dominance that UConn's women's team had in the 2000s and the 2010s. But not too long ago, football also had a home in the Big East, and it was pretty good too. We had players like Michael Vick at Virginia Tech, the many pros from one of the greatest squads ever at Miami, and even Pat White with the West Virginia Mountaineers almost making the national championship. Some of college football's best moments happened because of the Big East. But as it sits in the present day, football in the conference has moved on and ultimately ceased to exist, despite attempts to keep it up. A series of events led to the climax and the ultimate death of football in the conference, and this is the fall of Big East football. The Big East Conference was originally formed in 1979 by Dave Gabbitt, the former Providence men's basketball coach and athletic director. There were seven schools that formed the alliance. Providence, St. John's, Georgetown, Syracuse, Seton Hall, Connecticut, and Boston College. Other schools like Holy Cross and Rutgers initially declined their invitations, but Rutgers would later join on. A year later, Villanova would join, and then Pittsburgh did as well in 1982. The makeup of the conference would include some Catholic schools and serve to be a home for schools that just wanted to focus on basketball or remain independent in football at a high level. Another school, Penn State, also applied for membership in 1982, but only five of the schools voted them in, and they needed six in order to join the conference. The three that opposed, Georgetown, St. John's, and Villanova. This was a very close vote, and Villanova's opposition was really interesting. They had recently stopped playing football, so they joined the vote against Penn State joining in, just for Villanova to bring football back a few years later. If Nova had their football team then, maybe their vote would have been different. While Penn State was a growing football power, it just wasn't that strong on the hardwood, so at the time, the exclusion had a few reasons behind it. An admin by the name of Mike Trangisi said the conference would rue the day that the other three schools rejected the Nittany Lions. If only he knew. However, the prestige of the conference was slowly rising through basketball, and hit a peak in 1985 when St. John's, Georgetown, and Villanova all made it to the men's Final Four, with Villanova ultimately defeating Georgetown in the national championship game. With the success in basketball, the Big East decided it would expand to play football. This is where things would get weird for the conference. The structure would change, where there would be football and non-football schools. Rutgers, Miami, Temple, Virginia Tech, and West Virginia would join the conference to play football, but Miami would be the only team that was offered all sports membership immediately, and they were perhaps the biggest get of them all. So in 1991, we saw the conference play on the gridiron for the first time with its very weird structure. Miami, Syracuse, Virginia Tech, Pitt, West Virginia, Rutgers, Boston College, and Temple would all tee off, and the Big East immediately made its impact. Miami and Syracuse would both end the 91 season ranked in the top 15, with Syracuse at number 11 and Miami at number 1, going 12-0, defeating Nebraska in the Orange Bowl and claiming the national championship. Technically, Miami only played two Big East schools that year, but regardless, they were impressive every bit of the way. They defeated number 10 Houston, number 9 Penn State, and number 1 Florida State during the course of the regular season. The conference may have had something special on their hands from the jump. Syracuse and Miami again ran the conference for another consecutive season, and Miami was ranked number one again before they ultimately lost to Alabama in the Sugar Bowl to lose out on back-to-back -back national titles. Still, the conference would produce some of the best schools in the country for the next decade. In 93, the Mountaineers finished 11-1 and ranked number 7 in the AP poll after starting the year unranked and rose all the way to number 2 before losing their final game of the season. Then the Virginia Tech Hokies in 95 and 96 won back-to-back -back Big East titles under Frank Beamer. Around this time, Notre Dame was added to the conference as a full member with the exception of football. Unlike Miami, Notre Dame wasn't ready to give up its independent status on the field. 
With that, the Big East was just about better than ever. From 97 to 2002, it would be the Big East show around the football world. The Syracuse Orange would capture two conference titles in this span and would have quarterback Donovan McNabb be drafted number two in the 1999 draft to the Philadelphia Eagles. Then another dynamic quarterback in Michael Vick stole the show at Virginia Tech. Vick put up gaudy numbers and was a video game character at the quarterback position long before anyone knew what he could truly be. He was the Big East Rookie of the Year, Offensive Player of the Year, First Team All-American, Archie Griffin winner, and a Heisman finalist. The Hokies would go 11-1, losing the Sugar Bowl to FSU to cap off their impressive year. Then from 2000 to 2002, Miami not only ran the conference, but college football as a whole. They would go 21-0 in the Big East across this three year span. In 2000, they went 11-1 and was the New York Times national champion. In 2001, they cemented themselves as one of the greatest teams in all of college football history, going 12-0 and winning the Rose Bowl 37-14 over Nebraska, this time being claimed the national champion. This group would produce a record 38 NFL draft picks, with plenty of them being high draft picks and impact players at the next level. Some of those names included Ed Reed, Sean Taylor, Jonathan Vilma, and Clinton Portis, among many other talented names, and we could spend the entire video talking about them and their careers. The 2002 Canes started the season off at number one and steamrolled their way through their schedule. Although they did spend one week at number two despite being undefeated, they were still the best of the best. On January 3rd in the Fiesta Bowl, they would meet number two Ohio State in a game that went into double overtime. Ohio State would win that game 31-24 following a controversial pass interference call that would extend the game for the Buckeyes. The 2003 season would see Miami and West Virginia share the conference title, with the Hurricanes again being one of college football's best. In 2003, the ACC made the decision to expand its conference and they targeted a few schools in the Big East, including Miami, Syracuse, and Boston College. Five of the Big East schools, as a result, would sue the Big East over defections and stated that the moves would destroy the Big East. This was huge. The fact that these schools were even considering leaving was a shock, given the fact that many of them had previously promised they would never leave. These five suing schools contended that they spent millions on their football programs based on the presumed loyalty for the others. A shocking turn of events took place as the ACC extended an invite to Virginia Tech, which was one of the schools that were in the lawsuit. And once Virginia Tech got their offer to join the ACC, they immediately accepted the invitation with no hesitation. Miami decided to wait and see what counterproposals the Big East had, but they ultimately left for a fee of just $1 million before it would increase. This was a damning move for the Big East, and it came out of nowhere. Losing schools of this magnitude meant that the Big East membership in the BCS was in jeopardy and instabilities of essentially running two separate conferences within one were starting to show. While the non-football members were doing okay for the time being, the football members were scrambling. Boston College would also be leaving the conference eventually as they accepted the invitation from the ACC, but they wouldn't join until 2005. And the Big East was also losing another member because Temple football was soon expelled from the conference following 2004 due to low attendance numbers and production on the field. The sad part is the program needed just two votes to stay as a member, but they didn't get them. Now the conference was going through a rebuild that wasn't even planned for. Starting with UConn, a non-football member of the Big East, they would begin competing in the conference for football starting in the 04 season. The Big East as a whole would respond to the losses by adding a few promising programs. They targeted programs from Conference USA and Atlantic 10, with then Commissioner Trangisi stating that he wouldn't blindside these conferences like the ACC did. The Big East added Louisville, South Florida, Cincinnati, DePaul, and Marquette, with DePaul and Marquette being non-football members. With Miami winning nine conference titles from 1993 to 2003 and Virginia Tech capturing a few more, there was a chance for a new king in the conference. What resulted was a lot of parody and no one truly taking reins of the conference. West Virginia would be the one to quickly take control of the new Big East, where they would go 11-1, finishing number 5 in the AP poll and winning the Sugar Bowl over Georgia. Louisville would capture the Big East crown in 2006, where they ranked number 6 and finished at 12-1. This was actually a really good year for the conference. Five teams made bowl games, and in addition to Louisville's success, West Virginia finished ranked at number 10 and Rutgers at number 12, both going 11-2. 
things were actually looking good for the conference and they regained some national respect with the success of schools from the previous year. 2007 was perhaps the last big shot at glory for football. The Mountaineers of West Virginia, led by quarterback Pat White, running back Steve Slayton, and head coach Rich Rodriguez in his seventh year, started off by being ranked at number three in the country, but an early season loss on the road to South Florida saw them drop down to number 13. They would reel off six consecutive wins to land at the number two spot thanks to a lot of help from around the country. Their last test was against Pittsburgh in the backyard brawl, and then they were on their way to a national title. Pittsburgh only had two wins in the Big East to that date. It was almost a layup for West Virginia, but an early injury to Pat White left the offense struggling all day, and somehow, some way, the Panthers pulled off the 13-9 upset and ruined the conference's chance for a huge opportunity. Though the result was disappointing on the field, the Big East was still doing its thing. The Cincinnati Bearcats under Brian Kelly in 2009 went undefeated in the regular season and rose to the number 3 rank in the BCS and had Texas lost in the Big 12 title game that year, they would have had a real shot at the title game. But that didn't happen and they became the first automatic qualifying team to miss out on the BCS championship game despite being undefeated. They would ultimately lose to Florida in the Sugar Bowl to end the season. Surprisingly, some of the best moments, players, and teams came from this conference in the 2000s, even with all that happened. But from 2010 onwards, things just got weird. From 2010 to 2012, no team actually won the conference outright, and at least three teams shared the conference title in each season. 2010 was perhaps the saddest of them all, as the UConn Huskies, who went 5-2 in conference play, would be the best team from the conference and earn the right to play in the Orange Bowl with 8 wins on the season, only to get demolished by the Oklahoma Sooners. 2011 was a bit better as West Virginia went 10-3 overall, sharing the title with Cincinnati and Louisville and then winning the Orange Bowl 70-33 over Clemson, and this was that iconic team that had Geno Smith and the legend himself, Tavon Austin. But 2011 was the last iteration of that new Big East as we knew it, as more change was on the horizon, one that the conference ultimately wouldn't recover from. It was becoming more obvious by the day that the Big East wasn't a power conference in football even though it had that title. Teams were scraping by and were barely good enough across the FBS landscape, so solutions lay outside of the conference for many schools, and then it all happened so fast. The ACC came back once again, this time striking a painful blow to the whole conference in all sports. Pittsburgh and Syracuse left for the ACC following the end of the 2012 season, and West Virginia would leave for the Big 12 with immediate effect. Syracuse and Pittsburgh leaders were approached around September, and without hesitation, it felt that both of them accepted. It would end up being the loss of Syracuse that was apparently the damaging blow, as one source said Syracuse and the Big East were synonymous with one another for the entire history of the conference. When they left, there was no recovering. Syracuse was obviously a big powerhouse in basketball around that time and they were doing okay on the football field, so their loss definitely hurt. So 2012 was it for Big East football, and Temple was let back in for old time's sake, and it ended with a bang. Teddy Bridgewater and Charlie Strong from Louisville went 11-2 and made it to the Sugar Bowl where they won a stunner 33-23 over Florida. But this was it. Attempts were made to save the conference, but it ultimately didn't pay off. TCU was actually on track to join the Big East, but they opted for the Big 12 instead. Houston, SMU, UCF, Boise State, and San Diego State were all names linked to join the conference, but when Boise State decided against a full move, San Diego State opted not to join either. Navy and Memphis were on course to join too, but it was already too late. Louisville would depart for the ACC as well, Rutgers would join the Big 10 beginning in 2015, and that was all she wrote. All of the schools kind of just started to look out for themselves once one domino after the other fell. In February of 2013, ESPN reported that the Catholic Seven or the non-football members of the conference decided to leave as well, taking the Big East name with them. The remaining schools, UConn, South Florida, Cincinnati, and Temple would form the American Athletic Conference with a bunch of other schools who were from Conference USA. With the dust settling, that was the end of football in the Big East and was the official end of that iteration of the Big East. It was a short but intriguing journey that left memories for all college football fans but has ultimately been forgotten in a short period of time. There were many key moments over the course of history that played to their death that some people point to. First, 
Not adding Penn State was ironically a big blow to the conference. Penn State, as we know now, compete in the Big Ten and have been one of the most prestigious football teams in the country. The Big East would actually rue the day that they didn't add Penn State because they lost out on so much money, media, production, and even TV markets that would have been attracted to this school each week. If Penn State were added, the questions raised would Miami have left? Or would any of the schools have left for that matter? There would have been regional rivalries with Pitt, West Virginia, and Penn State and Miami would have been in a constant battle for who could finish in first each year. It would have for sure been a power conference. They could have targeted schools from other conferences to grow even further, and maybe they could have played the same role the ACC did. If Penn State joined, would other strong powers have eventually joined the Big East as well? Could Notre Dame have? That's probably a really far out hypothetical considering how strong Notre Dame has been as an independent for football, but who knows? Penn State not being allowed in by just one vote ruined the conference. Well, kind of. At its core, the Big East was always intended to be a basketball conference. So was this just fate? When football was brought over, so was greed. The full members, the ones who had football, sought huge TV deals like other power conferences had. Meanwhile, the others kind of just wanted to play ball. Dividing the conference into full members and non-football members, essentially two conferences in one, was unlike anything we had ever seen before, and it was something that certainly played into the demise of the conference. When Miami and Virginia Tech left for the ACC, the football schools wanted to all just leave together at that point, even going as far as drafting a letter for the remaining schools to just leave the conference. Soon, when realignment happened again from 2009 to 2012, every school that played football ultimately just looked after themselves and took the opportunity to jump ship when it was presented. Greed also took over in multiple ways. The Big East turned down an ESPN proposal in 2011 that would have bumped its annual payout from $36 million per year to $155 million per year. Maybe it was a little bit disrespectful considering that this conference was the one that brought the network all of its publicity from broadcasting basketball games, but nevertheless, the conference took the gamble, declining the offer and hoped that with other schools joining, the networks would increase their offer the following fall. The Pac-12 received an offer totaling $3 billion, and members saw that and wanted to take the risk on the open market, so that offer didn't feel good enough, and for some it was disrespectful. Of course, others couldn't wait, looked after themselves, and jumped to better opportunities. Some schools felt the love for the conference, while others felt that there were double agents in the room. For the schools though, there was no grant of rights, no consensus to keep the conference together, no TV deal, and no expansion plan, so anything was free game. Former West Virginia Athletic Director Oliver Luck put it best when he stated, There are no rules in this game of realignment, right? There wasn't an arbiter, you couldn't go to the NCAA or the federal government. It was a game we likened to musical chairs. You don't want to be the one standing when the music stops. At the end of the day, football is king, queen, the governing body, and the law in college sports. It brings in the most revenue and publicity to every university, and you have to maximize your product as much as you can. So the split of football schools and non-football schools was just never going to work out for the conference as a whole. And the ones who felt the realignment the most were ironically the basketball schools. The football members were always going to have a home one way or another, but those schools leaving the Big East meant the brand was much weaker for other sports, and that included basketball where many of these members made their money. While basketball was the draw of the conference, the one where the true history of it lay, football was the driver in where it went. Realignment ultimately ended football in the Big East because realignment brought together much more than just schools moving to new conferences. It created division among schools in the same conference, greed, and everyone looking out for themselves. Comments from Pitt Chancellor Mark Nordenberg sum that last part up best. In response to members originally wanting to leave for the ACC in 2003, he stated that this is a case that involves broken commitments, secret dealings, the misappropriations of conference opportunities, and predatory attempts to eliminate competition. Only to then say in 2011 that we were flattered by the ACC's interest in us. We're grateful to receive the invitation to join this very special conference and feel privileged to be moving forward in your company. Coincidentally, he was the same man who led the charge to decline the ESPN TV rights deal in the 2010s, showing that maybe there were double agents in the room. But the hypocrisy within the statements and actions just showed the true nature of where interests lay for most members. Everybody just looked out for themselves in the end. The cracks that existed in the foundation a long time ago, finally, 
just couldn't take it anymore. And that is the collapse, the fall of Big East football. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. There may have been some facts in this whole saga that I might have missed or might have misspoke on, but regardless, this is the story of Big East football, at least the one that is publicly told to us. So thank you guys for watching the video. Subscribe if you're new. And as always, I will see you guys next time. All right, so two things before the video actually ends. The first thing is that I'm happy to announce that I'm officially a partner with SeatGeek. So if you don't know what SeatGeek is, it is an app that you can use to buy and sell tickets for things like sporting events and for concerts. It's like Ticketmaster and StubHub. The thing I like about SeatGeek though the most is that it gives you a rating based on the deal that you're about to get for your tickets and it also gives you a view of the seats that you're about to get for the tickets for your respective event. I actually use SeatGeek a lot. It's my favorite app to buy tickets on. So I'm happy that they wanted me to be a part of their partner program. And if you use my promo code Jason0662, you can get $20 off your first purchase. Now, the second thing is that if you guys would like to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon in the description down below. Right now, I'm still trying to figure out what extras I wanna do. Maybe I'll have my Patreon members, their names at the end of each video, or I'll have my videos out a day early. But it's just another way for you guys to support the channel. It won't be anything major. It won't make you guys break the bank for it, especially not for this channel. But I am trying to do a little bit more outside of just uploading sports video essays. So maybe, you know, live streaming or talking about current events that are going on in sports and doing just different things other than just video essays for sports. So thank you guys again for watching and I'll see you guys next time.